Okay, I think we've got all that figured out. Check that back. Bingo. Cool. All right, so we are on. We are live. We are happening. Um, hello, friends and neighbors. Uh, <laughs> whatever strange relationships that, that you have that brings you to my world, or at least this tiny little corner of it. Um, those of you who were not with me last night um, have not seen my tiny little corner of my office. Um, we are living in a new house, although it's a very old house to me especially, um, and it's not really quite as small as it seems. I have pushed my desk back into the corner for various reasons, mostly having to do with boxes all over the place here, um, but also to do with light, which as you can see is still a problem. I've got bright lights coming in here since I didn't know what it would be like at this time of the day. Ah, uh, well, uh, first world problems, as they say. So here I am, there you are, we are, and we are the world, I guess. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, since it's Father's Day, I thought I'd show you my shirt here that my it's a Sherlock shirt. My daughter gave it to me some years ago for Father's Day. And yes, it says high functioning sociopath. Whether that's a joke or an accurate assessment of me, I don't know. Um, but that's what it is. And happy Father's Day to those of you who are celebrating it, either because you have fathers, you are a father, you know a father who you admire. Uh, fatherhood is a sometimes underrated position. Um, but as anybody who's had a good father, as I did, uh, will be able to tell you, it is nevertheless very, very important, uh, or at least very, very helpful and uh, a, a good thing to have in this world. So um, what else has been going on? So anyway, so we're in the middle of the move. I, as I mentioned before, and I keep trying to warn people, I'm not reading this weekend because I have not yet recovered a copy of uh, The Secrets of Ordinary Farm. Um, again, if I, I won't show you the rest of the office room here or any of our other rooms, but they all look much the same. They, they look like uh, 1930s New York if all of the skyscrapers were made out of piles of boxes. So although Deborah has been doing heroic work trying to get things somewhat back to a semblance of normality, and I have when I can, and also work on other things, um, we are still living in the... Uh, in Boxatopia, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, and because of that, the, uh, the books still remain lost. But by next week, I will either have acquired another copy or I will have found my copy. So I will finish off the book then. Then maybe read one more short book. I'm considering reading um, Brothers of the Wind. And then I'm probably going to have some kind of format change. But I do want to have time to figure that out and um, speaking of the other part of my last several weeks when we have not been in the midst of moving crises and there have been many um, I'll explain one of them to you in a moment when we have not been in the midst of moving crises I have been um, pecking away at the end of Navigator's Children now mind you when I say the end here what I'm talking about now is the end of the editing process um, the book itself was for all intents and purposes finished, albeit in rough form, uh, several months ago. And then all of this, this giant iceberg of crap reared up in front of our ocean liner of, uh, of family venture and uh, just knocked a hole in the side of it and changed things for a while. So because of that, I have had lost a lot of time. But Navigator's Children is pretty much done, so it will be out. I don't know exactly when or what's going on, but this is not one of those, oh, you know, he's working again, you know, kind of like maybe someday. No, this is actually pretty much finished. Um, and it's bloody long, so you will see. It was not, um, you know, not a quick turnover, not an easy book to edit, uh, even with all the help from my very many... Um, extremely kind and helpful um, contributors. So who will all be credited? So um, because they deserve it for helping me to get through this thing, which has actually been going on now for, God, not not talking about the original Memory Song and Thorn, not talking about Ostinard, which really pretty much began to take shape back in the mid-1980s. 
Um, but uh, just this last series of books, uh, the the last King of Ostinard and the things that go with it, um, actually I started thinking about it, I think back in like 2013. Um, so we're approaching 10 years, which even for me, um, is a very long time. Uh, the, the first Ostinard series took me seven years and I had a divorce and a move to another country in the middle of that. So, um, but again, we have had a number of other things, including um, big corporate changes for my publishers and COVID. And I had to have a shoulder operation in the middle of it, which ate close to a year of working time between the pain before the operation and the rehab and pain after the operation. So while I, I don't feel like I'm, I've, I've failed in taking that long, it's just been a fact, a fact of how life is at the moment, um, I nevertheless am just as excited to get it finished and get it out as any reader could possibly be. So that's what's going on. I am literally in the last you know, probably a couple weeks before the book leaves my hand um, for the next stage, which is proofreading and typesetting and, you know, all that kind of stuff. What else is there to talk about? Deborah has been working hard, as always. Um, as a matter of fact, I think my most common advice to her these days is don't overdo it. Um, as she has a tendency to just run until she exhausts herself. I don't mean literally run, but I mean, you know, just work on whatever she's working on until she literally can't work anymore and then you know immediately crash out and but uh, so she's needless to say has had very full hands not just with the move but with a bunch of other stuff that was already going on oh and just as an example i said i was going to tell you about this just as an example of you know the fun that life likes to roll to you in the midst of of chaos um, not only were we going through like changing banks and trying to move and trying to prepare our house to be rented, which meant a lot of remodeling while we were still in it and trying to get ready to move. Um, but then in the week that we were moving, literally the week we were moving, the place where we had stored a bunch of stuff from previously when we cleared out our garage, we had a couple of tons of stuff that went to a storage place. And uh, they called us up or emailed us or whatever and informed us that they were going out of business. So we could either come and get our stuff. Um, again, mind you, this is right in the middle of moving week. We could either come and get our stuff or it would be presumably set on fire or, God knows, dumped you know, in, into the Baylands here in the Bay Area somewhere. Anyway, it was not something that we were willing to do. Not just because we had some very valued things in there, including a lot of our folk art stuff that we collect, uh, paintings and quilts and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of other things we hadn't even looked at because we had just said, well, we know they'll be safe. We'll put them into storage. We won't need these for months. So there were a lot of, you know, pictures, family albums, stuff like that. Anyway, so we, this will make more sense to those of you who live in the Bay Area. But so we, we went down to San Jose to go and we hired a moving truck to bring the stuff back. And they met us down there in San Jose. And the address where the uh, storage company was, was literally a, a flat nothing. And I mean nothing. I mean asphalt and a few little strands of dry grass. And there's like nothing there. So we kept driving around and driving around trying to figure out if we had it because it was out by the airport, you know, so it was in a kind of a weird industrial area anyway. So we drove around and drove around and finally called these people and they went, oh, well, we moved to Concord. <laughs> Jeez, thank you for letting us know that before we hired a moving van and went down to San Jose. Now, for those of you not in the Bay Area, Concord is like an hour and a half away from from certainly from San Jose and where we live and even further from the Santa Cruz side. So um, anyway, not to belabor this because we eventually got it all dealt with and had, you know, another day we had to do it. And, you know, so it, it but that's just how things are. And I, I'm telling you this, if you're doing anything important, whether it be moving, getting married, um, you know, whatever it might be, that's like one of those big occasion things that requires all of your attention and, and, and fortitude, Plan on it taking twice as long and costing twice as much as your best estimate. Okay? That's like I'm at that point in life where I'm allowed to give this kind of advice. Okay? I have been there. I have done it. I have actually conducted 
nine or ten weddings. So I know where I speak with weddings and I totted it up during because Deb and I were having a, a slight disagreement, not a disagreement, but I, Deb, Deb always kind of teases me about how little I like moving and how much I am resistant to it every time the idea has come up. Whereas Deborah is more open-minded and seems to require, seems to, seems to picture moving as being um, a part of life's journey and an evolutionary move, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. Whereas to me, it's like being um, dug up like a feral fox and dragged by your tail out of your den and then chased away by dogs. You know, I, we have a very different take on the whole idea of moving. So anyway, I, um, here's why I have expertise on moving. I, I said, you know, I think I've, it's not like I never do it. And I went back and looked at all, all the places I've lived since I was a kid, 29, 29 places. Now, admittedly, a lot of those were in that early stage that young people get in between graduating high school and settling down and having kids. You know, there were a lot of moves in there. But still, you know, I mean, we're still talking quite a few moves, including one, two, one, two of them between countries. Um, and so between the fact that I have performed many weddings as the, um, whatever you call them, I forgot, there's a name they use now for people who perform weddings um, who are not, in fact, religious. Um, and but between those and my moves, I mean, I know about this stuff, so I'm telling you, okay? I'm telling you guys. Anytime you're going to do something complicated, it's good. And that, you know, I'm, like I said, weddings, moves, overthrowing a democratically elected government, you know, it's going to take you a lot more time and a lot more money than you think it will. Okay? Okay. That just wanted you to know that. So, what else is going on? This is all I'm doing, by the way, today. I'm going to check and see who's who's here in just a minute. But other than that, this is just me talking because I'm not going to be reading tonight. So, if you got this far and missed that point and you're going, oh my God, is he just going to talk for half an hour? Yes. Yes, that is true. Um, not only that, it is only going to be about half an hour probably or whatever because I don't have that much to say. Not that I can't talk meaninglessly for hours at a stretch if necessary or even if somebody just lets me but uh, I wouldn't subject you to to that because you're nice people anyway um, so what else big dog Johnny super nervous slowly settling in likes the fact that he gets more walks here does not like the fact that the roof creaks in a way that the roof in the old house does not and every time he hears a roof creak his apparent perception is that a 450 pound cat is on the roof looking for him and he gets up and runs out of the room and finds you know whatever his current safe space is which is usually as far from where the creek happened as possible that's c-r-e-a-k um but other than that you know he's he's doing okay he's eating he's healthy you know we're taking him out for walks all that stuff so even though he's nervous he's not appreciably more nervous than at the old house um maybe a little bit but it's certainly understandable small dog walter is utterly oblivious to anything except for his own personal needs and desires um because he is almost entirely deaf now i don't think he understands that he's whenever he his will is balked in any way whatsoever he lets out those horrible high-pitched death barks that um everybody hates <laughs> even the people who love him we're like oh god walter stop uh and uh but other than that you know i mean we probably could have moved to the moon you know, the first martian colony whatever you know we could have gone anywhere and as long as he kept getting fed and uh had warm bodies to curl up next to because he's a really skinny chihuahua and he has no body heat of his own in fact he sucks body heat away from the rest of us but fortunately he's small so he can't suck that much heat away anyway so walter john fine are two young people who are still living with us they're doing okay too um as i mentioned deb working too much as always but still okay and me Hanging in as best as possible, getting my work done when I can, not getting my work done when I can't, and feeling wretched about it. But these are the times when when all good people must must rise to the uh, the 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 good of the the family unit or whatever it is that's that's being mobilized at a given moment. So, best of times, worst of times, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm sure there's other things I've forgotten to mention, none of them any more interesting than the boring stuff I just mentioned, but um, can't think of them at the moment. So, 
I am going to see who else seems to be here and if they will why can't I get actual comments on the flipping dipping thing um, don't know still doesn't explain it to me but okay that account does not want to be there okay that account does this account does okay so as you can see I'm still struggling with Facebook which hates me I don't know why I don't know what I ever did to Facebook I don't think I ever did anything I don't think I ever snuck up behind Facebook and pushed it down the stairs okay maybe uh, anyway let me say hello to the folks who have commented here and that Facebook is deigning to tell me about because they're only showing me five comments so that does me no good whatsoever Oh God, and now it stopped doing it again. Just show me who commented. You just let me do it a moment ago. Oh. Have I mentioned that I just absolutely never thought I would be one of those old people who hated modern technology? And it's not that I do. I don't, it's, I don't hate modern technology. I hate that it doesn't work right. Okay, and no, it won't let me see. I just saw a bunch of names just five seconds ago, and now all of a sudden it won't show them to me. For what reason? I don't know. It, it's an absolute mystery. Oh, Lord. Um, anyway, yeah, the comments are coming in. They're not making it to my page, and I can't read them. Um, I can tell you who is who I can see comments from, which is one from Christy, one from Ray. Ray asks how the kitty's doing. Kitty's doing fine. I'm just working really hard to convince the young person whose room she is sharing that Johnny is not trustworthy and it's not a good idea to try to introduce them to each other that there's a reason we kept them separated for years Johnny is a hunting dog he was not raised around small animals um, the only reason he hasn't eaten our chihuahua is because the chihuahua first of all was here first and therefore had hierarchical dominance and secondly because the, the chihuahua is fierce AF and used to regularly um, punish Johnny for bad behavior by leaping up and grabbing Johnny's jowl and hanging on it his entire little body dangling like a like a charm on a bracelet um, and Johnny would just stand there looking really stunned and just take it um, so anyway so that's what's going on yeah Oh, sh I hate you, you stupid Facebook thing. Anyway, so yeah, the only comments I can see at the moment are Christy, Jeremy, Angie, and Tiffany. <sighs> no, it just will not let me. I, it says I have 44 comments. I don't know why it won't let me see anything, but that's something I'm going to have to deal with. I'm going to have to get off of Facebook. All of these things drive me mad, but again, I, I will figure it out long term. Um, because right now my brain is small so I apologize for not being able to say hello to people in person and let me let me let me just let me get my sincere get my sincere on here um, I really do I really do um, enjoy doing this and I really do value um, you folks not because you're readers or because you buy my books but because you actually take the time to <laughs> come and join me on these meandering jabber fests um, or to listen to me read or whatever something we started you know as a COVID kind of get together and we're still doing it now um, I don't as I said before I don't know what's gonna come next but I have a feeling it will be more complicated and less just me reading and more um, different topics and things like that to talk about but as I said once I've had a chance to kind of work on that a little bit uh, for one thing I think I'd have to um, be able to bring in a few more illustrative visuals and stuff like that and you know I mean my pictures and things in my office are fine but they're not really conducive to you know trying to make a point about something you know what are you gonna say look here's my office it's full of crap <laughs> that proves that I know what I'm talking about um, anyway so let's see what else is going on here if now there's 52 comments will it let me see any of the people or anything no of course not oh wait here maybe over here yeah okay good now I can finally say hello to some people I had to go to another part of the of uh, 
my page, but here it's apparently allowing me to at least see, oh, and 33 more. Anyway, the people whose comments they have noticed, to whom I'm saying hello. Hello, Emily. Emily Bell, good to see you. Tim Speckins, as always, a pleasure. Angie, which I think I said, who I think I said hello to earlier, but I will say it again. Hello, Angie and Jeremy. Vivs Moyano, hello, good to see you. Jay, my dear friend Jay, one of my favorite human beings. Good to see you, Jay. Um, Jay, by the way, is uh, among many other things, is a, a bookstore owner and owns Dark Carnival and has been a really important part of the Bay Area science fiction fantasy scene for decades, for yonks, as we say in, in England, um, and is also just a fabulous human being. So if you have access to social media, you should check Jay out. Um, who else? Ray. Hello, Ray. Yes, I knew you were on here somewhere because I kept seeing you before the thing would disappear again. So hi, good to have you. Karen Grennan, good to see you too. A pleasure. Cliff, as always, hope the family's well. Our family's hanging in there. Becca, hello, Becca. And Kristen, another faithful friend. Good to see you. And Medardo, amigo mío, bienvenido. Um, I've forgotten how to say welcome back again. Aunque is although. So how do you say it? I've forgotten again. Um, my Spanish is... I haven't been using it lately. I'm very ashamed. Um, but uh, anyway... Good to have you back, Medardo. A pleasure as always. Isaac! Isaac checking in from the wilds. Good to see you. Um, and who else? Annie. Annie's an old an old online, not old like as a person, but an, a, a longtime online friend. Claudia. Hello, Claudia. And Barb Ann. Good to see you too. Trish Laubacher, a pleasure, and Christy Sanders, who I think I already said hello to Christy. Um, but and 34 more, it says, but I don't know. Those people are just comments or people or whatever. Um, so, and Melissa. Oh, did I say hello to Melissa? Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, no, I, I had, uh, speaking of, of modern technology, as some of you know, or as many of you may know, I, I worked, my last sort of normal job, my last ordinary job, uh, I worked for Apple Computer in the late 1980s. Um, when they were already very much a going concern. In fact, Steve Jobs was gone at that point and had been replaced by um, John Scully, the Pepsi Co executive, and they were in the midst of their let's turn this into a Pepsi versus Coke rivalry and, you know, let's go after IBM, which was, uh, in retrospect, and even at the time for a lot of us, was kind of a stupid idea um, and completely missed the point because what they were arguing about. Um, while they were arguing with each other about who was superior, um, the, uh, the folks at Microsoft said, well, why should we be fighting with these people who want to build computers and printers and all this hardware? All we have to do is make the software, and it's a lot cheaper, <laughs> and, and everybody will have to use it. Um, and then, of course, you know, all those things happen, and Bill Gates rose to become, you know, the most the richest man in the world and became a character in one of my novels, uh, albeit somewhat indirectly. And yes, in case you guys didn't know this, here's a little tidbit for you. One of the only ways to um, fix a date on the Otherland books, and this is, you know, this is not official. This is my behind the scenes thing. The only way to fix a date on the Otherland books as to roughly when they're supposed to be happening is to assume that the character named Robert Wells is a, a version of Bill Gates. And it's not a deeply constructed character. I didn't try to get to know everything about Bill Gates and you know critique his existence. It's just that he runs a gigantic technology ex, ex, a giant technology enterprise called Telemorphics, which is the name of my old company with my friend Andy Harris. Um, and uh, Telemorphosis has to do with dreaming over distance. It was a word I coined and which I was never able to make happen. <laughs> but Telemorphix with an X at the end is the name of Robert Wells's company. So since Robert Wells is supposed to be, as we say, roughly cognate with Bill Gates, you can look at the age because uh, Robert Wells talks about his advanced age in the book. You can look at Robert Wells's age and get a grip uh, or at least a hint as to if you re uh, attach that to, to Bill Gates again, how old Bill Gates would be 
um, when he was that same age, which is like 100 and something, I think. And that will give you an idea of when, in my mind, when I was writing it, that Otherland was supposed to be. Now, quickly, an interesting thing about Otherland is, of course, that as far as science fiction goes, the problem with writing science fiction in any near future predictive sense is that you were almost invariably going to be proved wrong, not necessarily by any one thing, but by which things happen and which things never happened and which things happen, but they haven't are going to happen, but they haven't happened yet. And so in the Otherland books, where I wasn't seriously trying to write a science fiction prediction of what was going to happen in the decades ahead, but more a kind of a social satire as far as the science fictional, here's the future that's coming part. And a lot of that proved to be kind of frighteningly accurate. Um, and uh, But other things happened faster than I thought they would or slower than I thought they would. And that is what happens in science fiction. Nobody gets it 100% right. And certainly if somebody ever does get it 100% right, it won't be me. That's not what I do. Um, I'm more in the Ray Bradbury end of science fiction, you know, where I like the science and I like to take an idea and run with it. But I do not claim to be a scientist and I have to rely on actual scientists to explain to me what the things that I'm fascinated by actually mean. Anyway, that was a long and roundabout. Um, but the main thing was that uh, I was just giving you that little fact about uh, Bill Gates. So anyway, I see, I write like I talk and I talk like I write. I was on this in the first place because I was talking about working for Apple Computer in the late 1980s. And one of the things that was going on at the time was this growing split between management, which was increasingly, and this is only when I was there, I'm not speaking for anything going on at Apple these days or any time in between. I'm just talking about when I was there. There was a very distinct split or schism happening between management and engineering. And one of the reasons this happened was because in an effort to make the company more economic, they got rid of a lot of the older uh, engineers who were expensive because they'd been there a long time and, and Apple had been a generous employer. So they got rid of as many of them as they could and then brought in, you know, a lot of managers from, as far as I could tell, a lot of people sort of from Eastern business schools, a lot of biz ad majors, including people who had been high executives in other companies that had nothing to do with the computer industry. So, for instance, the guy who was the head of my sort of division of the company um, had last been, he had worked most of his career at Scott Towel, making paper towels and toilet paper. And, but there was this idea, I guess, then that, well, these Silicon Valley companies have to be brought under control by real business people. And in fact, there's no difference between selling soft drinks and paper towels and selling computers. Well, that was crap, as it turned out. But one of the ways in which it was proven to be crap in this classic way, I love this story. The, um, sometime during the time I was there, uh, Apple began building the first ever laptop, as far as I know. But it was the first laptop, you know, commercial laptop for consumers. And the thing just got, was it was huge. It was huge. It had, you know, it was like, had a big old handle on it. It was really heavy. It was like 17 pounds or something. And, and in the initial stages, the engineers referred to it jokingly as the boat anchor. And then as the price kept climbing of what they were going to have to charge for it, it became known as the yacht anchor. But anyway, so when we finally got to the point where it was being tested for the first time, the engineers came in and said, you know, this is a debacle. This is not going to work. And the executives who had been pushing the product project all the way, the executives said, you know, like, what are you talking about? It's, it's beautiful. It's this, it's that. It's like, and the engineer said it weighs 17 pounds. It collapses the tray tables on an airplane on, you know, on a commercial airplane. And the executives looked at each other and, and one of them said, well, it doesn't do that in first class. So that, that, was, the, that was the atmosphere um, at Apple at the time I was there. And I was actually involved in an early sort of proto-union group at Apple because we had so much trouble getting the executives to, to understand that, that 
in a company that 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 is based on ideas and you know freedom to to create and all this stuff that this old fashioned idea of <clears throat> worrying only about the chain of command and the hierarchy and reorganizing every few weeks it felt like you know and oh well now we're in such and such division under so and so and blah 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 and that now your our reports are here and here and blah blah, blah you know and I was not an important employee at Apple, so I don't ever for a moment mean to suggest I was. I was I was working in the uh, essentially the library, um, writing technical articles. But it gave me a real insight, and I'd been in other kinds of businesses too. But it gave me a real insight into why, for one thing, for one thing, why we have creeping middle managementism in this society of ours you know where more and more people kind of are squeezing into the middle management area and so doing anything requires endless meetings and middle managers always want to know if people are being productive they hate you know the working from home stuff because it's harder to kind of mosey around and look at people and go hmm doesn't look like he's typing enough or whatever so anyway, I have a bit of a prejudice against this. Not against middle managers, middle managers as people. Many of them are excellent at what they're doing, and many of them are absolutely vital to the way companies are set up. But as a species, they have evolved to fill a niche in business that, and frankly, is overpopulated. Let's put it that way. Anyway, so I have now babbled at you for half an hour or more. And that's really all I wanted to do, not the babbling part, but I just wanted to check in and connect with you guys and let you know I have not forgotten or given up on the idea of a regular get-together. So as far as I know, I will be back next week at the same standard times. So this slot will still be 7 o'clock Pacific Daylight Time, right? We're in PDT right now. Um, and uh, until it's something else, I thought they were going to I thought we were going to stay in PDT this time, but apparently, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, doesn't matter. Whatever time it is in California, at 7 p.m. next week, I will be there, just as I will be there at 1 a.m. in the morning before that, also Pacific time. So, with all of that said, um, I want to thank you again for joining me. It's always a pleasure. Um, it always makes me wonder. Oh, shush. It always makes me wonder what else you could have been doing instead um, and and feeling sorry for you <laughs> that you couldn't find anything better to do than listening to me going, nah, 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 nah. but since you have chosen to do that, I am grateful and I thank you and I want you all to take good care of yourselves. Okay, take good care of yourselves, your friends, your loved ones um, and any other random folks that need some help. And I will see you very soon, next week, in fact. So thank you for joining me. Pleasure as always. Peace. Be well.